We are back again. Thanks for joining us on what we feel like will be another illuminating discussion presented by Bryson White, uh, Bryson Wen Presents. Presented by Bryson Wen Presents. <laughs> right? Exactly. Okay, cool. Bryson Let's get a hand. Presents. Let's get a Bryson hand. So today we're going to be talking about the concept of being a player but being cast as a character in reality television. I'm Mert Schaffer, the former host of Reality Obsessed and currently an associate producer at The Morning Show on Global. And I am Hartley Jaffeen, a survivor professor where I teach a course on Survivor at McMaster University. The course I teach is called Surviving Survivor Insights from Reality TV for Real Life. And accompanying Mertz and I, we've got some very special guests for you this evening. And we're going to introduce them to you now. First up, we have... Big Brother Canada winner, 10, season 10, Kevin Jacobs! Are you comfortable? <laughs> Next up, ball game himself, from Big Brother Canada, the last winner, Ty McDonald. I'm very excited to introduce the next guest that we have because she is a McMaster alum, season 42 of Survivor's winner, Marianne Oketch. Now, I never thought we would get this next guest, especially because he is the most recent Survivor winner. Let's give it up for Jam Jam. Finally, the two people who brought us here tonight. Can I introduce season of Survivor 28 Kagayan, Bryce Isaiah. And Survivor Ghost Island winner, Wendell Holland. So welcome, welcome everybody. Today and tonight, the discussion is gonna focus on the topic of player versus character. Now we all know intellectually that when we see a play or a movie, that we are watching actors playing characters. When it's done well, we forget that they're playing characters. We think that they're the actual people and we get immersed in the world of the fiction. But when it's over, the audience is able to detach. We can recognize that we are watching actors performing as characters. However, with reality TV, there is no character. It is presented as people playing themselves. Thus, we see their actions as linked to their personhood, their values, their morals, despite not seeing a full and complete picture of what is actually occurring on the island or in the Big Brother house. But still, we judge their characters based on what we are allowed to see. Many have often asked about the longevity of reality TV and what has allowed it to continue basically for an unprecedented success for more than two decades. The fact is that it presents itself as an enhanced version of real life, but on deeper examination, it isn't really real life, is it? Shows like Survivor, Big Brother, The Challenge, and The Amazing Race feature real people, but they are edited into characters that the audience can root for and root against. And this process of being edited starts long before filming begins for Survivor or Big Brother. It begins during casting as players compete to be on the show itself. And that's where our conversation tonight will begin. So we're going to kick things off with a section that uh, we like to call, Who Were You Before the Show? Uh, I'm going to start uh, and we're going to go down the line. So Kevin, you're up first. I hope you got your cheat sheet over there ready. Prepared okay, much. nice. Okay. Uh, how would you describe yourself as a person prior, prior to being cast on your show? And do you still see yourself as that same type of person after the show? Ambitious, friendly, and fun. And I still see myself as the same person. I think that it's very easy to change your identity based on how you do or experience the show. If anything, I feel more like myself because I think in some ways you can't escape who you are in these situations. 
and if you have to face who you are in these very intense games and some people like it some people won't i think it only gives you permission to be that same person who got cast in the first place and ty you're up next basically uh, how would you describe yourself before going on big brother canada and now uh, I, would say I, I was a very, and still am a very family-oriented person. Um, I, care, I care a lot about the people around me, so I'll go above and beyond for anybody who I say I'm loyal to. Um, very driven, motivated. Sometimes I can come off as being cold or not caring, but I do have a big heart. Uh, I'm the same person I am now as I was before I got on the show. Um, it was obviously edited very differently, but uh, that was something I made sure to stay true to myself heading on to the show, like, I'm going to be myself going on and I'll be the same person whether I get evicted first or I get, you know, if, if I win the show. So that's something I, I, I held true to. And yeah, what you see is what you get with me kind of thing. Did you say ball game before the show? That was, yeah, that's the thing me and my friends just say. We play Call of Duty and that's what we say to end the game. So it's crazy that it actually caught on and became my catchphrase, you know, I just authentically. So, Marianne? Ooh, before the show. You see, I was so enamored in everyone's answers. You're gonna have to ask the question again for me. Sure. Uh, basically, how would you describe yourself before going on Survivor, and did that perception change after you watched the edit of yourself? You know what? I'd describe myself as someone who's bubbly, someone who's kind, and I'd describe myself as someone who like is very cerebral and intellectual. When just going and seeing myself on the show, it's really interesting because I did see that bubbly, I did see that kind, but a lot of times the intellectual was missing. But I think that it's really important that when you go on the show, if you know yourself, then it doesn't matter then what's seen on the show or what's not seen on the show. And it's like, so it's more so, does it matter what, how I believe and how I think myself is? And I was like, yeah, I think, still think I'm these things. So I still think I was the same before as I was after. Jam Jam. Hi. Um, I always thought I was, you know, funny. And, you know, I, I would say whatever I want, I still do. Um, and fearless in the terms of the of the way I express myself, and I no regrets about anything I do, and it has to do with the fact that I deal with so many people daily that are from so many different backgrounds. Um, during the casting process, I do remember they trying to me talk about how in the gossip in the hair salon and how Latin families work and everything, and I fought that back during the casting process because I was like, yeah, there's gossip, but there's not that doesn't describe me. Um, so I tried to change the narrative of who they saw I was through my own like thinking about, oh wait, they're trying to tell me to do, like they did with Carla, I was like, she's Mosa. And we got casted in the same pr moment. So I, when I saw she's saying she's Mosa, I was like, that's what they wanted me to say. But it's not how I talk about myself. But yeah, like I love people, I'm a people person, I try to be funny and just be 100% who I am because I had a long time that I wasn't happy with who I was. But when I got on Survivor, I was already that. So if anything, I just got more intense. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <laughs> Bryce? Uh, I think when I played Survivor uh, before the show, I was very young. I was very outgoing and very insecure. And I think that after the show, I feel like I went through a transitional period. I feel like the show, I was uh, a caterpillar. And after the show, I really got to come out of the cocoon and be this butterfly. And I think that I'm a more outspoken, I'm a more empathetic, I'm still crazy, and I'm a little <laughs> sassy, savage. Uh, but uh, I think that I've evolved, so. When? Okay, tough act to follow. Um, I'd say before the show, I was very driven, I was um, very competitive, um, ambitious, and I, I think I demanded a lot of myself, like I had, yeah, I de demanded a lot from myself and I wanted to like achieve a lot of things. And after my first time playing Survivor, I really thought that like just anything is possible. I'm like, you know, I was able to go out here after years of applying, like seven years, finally got on and I actually won this thing so then I thought anything was possible. And then I went out there and I played again, <laughs> thinking anything was possible. And then uh, I had a different result. So um, I think I was a little more skeptical after playing a second time. And um, I guess after that time, I was a little jaded, but I think now being a few years after playing a second time and seeing how I was edited and whatnot and having my own thoughts about that, I think I'm remote enough now to kind of have a new perspective and see it as like, 
I had both sides of the coin. I, I had a great edit and I had a not so great edit. And now I can kind of like understand anything is possible, but you got to like, you know, you got to put a lot to it. You got to work hard and, and whatnot. So that's where I'm at. I, I, I think I saw both sides. Yeah. Would you say you were the same person both times, right? Oh, yeah, you're asking the question that was asked. Um, <laughs> I do think. I think, I think I was the first. I would think I was the same person both times before and after, like a very driven person and someone with a positive outlook on life. But I think, I think the second time made me a little more realistic and understand that, like, you're not in control of all things. Well, it sounds like for all of you, you had really high expectations coming into the season, things that you really wanted to get out of it and things and ways that you saw yourself. This is a question to you, Marianne. You went into the season, your season, seeing every episode of Survivor minus six episodes of Token Cheens. <laughs> and so when you going in with that kind of mindset as a super fan, did you have expectations of the type of role or character that you would be presented as kind of entering the game? Yeah, I did have expectations. And those expectations actually come as well, too, from casting. Because when you're in casting and you're going and you're meeting people, well, like your casting person will go, OK, like you had a great interview. It's like, so next time on this call, how about you talk about this, 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 this? So you kind of know exactly what they want you there for. So I think when going in, they're always like, oh, just literally be yourself. I'm like, OK, so they want me for my personality. I'm, you know, how there's personality hires, I'm a personality cast. So. <laughs> I think in that moment they're like, they just want like a young, bubbly, excited person who's just really excited to be there. So that's what I expected going in the show. And of course I was grateful because it was a dream. And then when I went and saw myself on TV, I recognized what I was expecting to see. If you worked in casting and you yourself came up to yourself and you're like, why would I cast this person? What would you say to that casting agent? Like for example, I'll start with you, uh, Kevin. Um, if you went to a casting agent and said, I'm Kevin Jacobs, what does Kevin Jacobs bring to the table? And did that come out after you saw yourself on the show? Cocky, full of himself, super fan, should be gone by week three. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people go in and they, and they talk a lot before and then they don't necessarily do what they say they're gonna do. I did a lot of what I said I was gonna do, but I did it in less of a rude way and once I was in the house, I think other than in the diary room or the confessional where it is sometimes a, a game that you're playing and you're maybe hamming it up for the cameras a little bit, I, I forgot whatever persona that was. But if I was in casting, I'd be like, this guy is going to be a problem and fun to watch and won't be on the show very long. And, and Bryce, what about you? Like, same question. Like, if you were sort of trying to sell yourself to a casting agent, what would you say? And do you feel like the edit that you got matched what you said in casting? Um, I feel like I would say, take a look at me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, <laughs> what you see is what you get. Uh, I am very outgoing. Again, I would really just encourage the person that I saw at that time to really be himself, right? To not worry about what people think or how you might act or how you might sound, but really kind of encourage that. And I feel like casting during my time, I felt like they kind of wanted me in a very particular box. And on my season, I was the like I was othered a lot. And so it was very difficult for me to feel comfortable in a space like that to really be fully myself. But if I were a casting producer, I would really like take my, take Bryce into a room and say like, you are it, right? Kagiyan is nothing without you. Mm -hmm. And bring that personality, bring that energy, bring that love, bring that craziness, bring that compassion. Don't let you being by yourself out here stop you from going after what you came out here to do. And, and Ty, did you tell them that you were just going to go out and win everything? Because that's what we saw you do. Was, there, was that something you sort of build yourself as? No, I told them I was going to win the show, but I didn't tell them that I was going to win comps together. Like, my whole goal was to come in there, be low-key, just kind of skate by until I had to start winning. And then, unfortunately, something happened where it forced me to start winning very quickly. Um, but, yeah, I just went in there. I wanted to be just a very low-key player, which is why me and Zach got along so well, because he was the loud, you know, energy in the room. And I had no problem with him doing his thing and then me just kind of you know, playing my part and getting the information that I needed. Um, but when things hit the fan, I had, to adjust, I had to adjust, and that's what I did. But, yeah. And what about you, Jam Jam? You're coming into the, your season. You leave the casting room. What do you think your producer is saying about you? That I have <laughs> to be in it, of course. <laughs> Please. 
that's what Jeff told me at the finale. <laughs> but um, my my thing is that every single conversation that I have, every time, yeah, I remember what I say, but every conversation is so different from the previous one because I can say like I went on the island and I was like I'm gonna say this joke and this and this and then the shit that they show I can I say I don't know whatever <laughs> um, I didn't remember the stuff I said like from the way I said it because you I go my brain works in a different way and I just start talking from another point like from here um, but I think they saw that I think they saw that because I can't shut up and I'm doing it right now again, but, um, and they just saw that I could just spin it and spin it and spin it, and I'm, I'm a very perceptive person in the terms of like when I see what the feedback of people are going and if it's shutting down, turning off, whatever. So I think they just saw, even Jeff, like Jeff wanted to hang up and I talked to him three more minutes than he, what he wanted. <laughs> I was like, I'm not done, and I have to tell you why, and I think he liked that because that's what he's looking for, somebody to bounce ideas from so that's what I gave them I don't know if that answered the question but it definitely did and actually your answer beautifully segues to where we want to go next so you're talking about how half the stuff you said on the show you were surprised by it and we want to talk a bit about that now but what we saw on the show because casting begins to develop those characters they see who you are in the casting space and they start to think about who is this person and what type of character can we put onto TV and that transitions and shifts because casting is about who you are before the show and then it all of a sudden transitions to who you are when you're on the show because it's one one thing to dazzle them when you're fully fed and have a good night's sleep it's another thing once you're on the show and you're hungry or you're competing against each other in the big brother house so over to you Mertz so I think I think one of the things that I've noticed in in watching these shows is that we need to always or we're sort of force-fed a likable winner you know like you have to have a likable winner at the end of the show um, we'll get to you Wendell because I know I'm gonna definitely ask you about that for the third time um, but I want to start with Ty on this one you know like Ty when you had the whole alliance with like Zach and then when the whole letter thing happened with like hope I felt like you were being edited as a villain right and then when they sort of seemed to realize that nobody's going to beat this guy, he's going to like basically win his way to the end, they started making you look a little bit more sympathetic, somebody that we should get behind. Yeah. Did you notice that shift at the time it was filming? And what about watching it after? Did you notice that sort of light switch? It's, uh, it's tough because the whole sympathy thing that you're saying you saw towards the end, that actually was how I ended up in the Lettergate situation. I was me trying to be sympathetic to hope. People don't see the whole situation for what it was. You only see what they're showing you. But the reason why he was able to get away with the letter was because I was being sympathetic to him and didn't want to rat him out. So that, that's why it was kind of frustrating to see my edit and how I turned into a villain trying to be a good guy to somebody. Um, but I did kind of, while I was in the house, see where my storyline was going with how my diary room sessions were going and the kind of questions they were asking me and the prompts they were giving me. Uh, I would say what I felt and then it would be like, okay, well, can you say it like this? And I'm like, well, that's not how I feel, but sure, if that's what you want. Um, so that kind of gave me an idea in terms of, you know, the storyline that was being built about me outside. And then by the end of it, I, I think it's kind of like a two-way thing. Obviously, like you said, you know, it's ideal to have a likable winner in the end. So I'm sure it was in their best interest to make sure people kind of at least liked me in some sense at the end. But I also think that towards the end when there's only four or five people, you have way less people to work with in terms of content. Mm -hmm. So like in the beginning when there's 16 people, you can be very selective with what you're showing about me. When there's only four or five people, you got to show everything because then you'll be missing a bunch of context. So I think their hands were kind of tied at the end where there's only me, Daniel C, and Claudia, for example. You have to show the sympathetic side of me because yeah. then you're missing a whole part of the story, right? So I think it goes both ways, yeah. Was it, was, I, I feel like for the rest of you, was it likable the whole way? Like Marianne, I thought it was likable the whole way. Kevin, I thought it was likable the whole way. At Jam Jam, you had your moments, but for the most part, I think, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, so we'll start with Marianne. And if you don't mesh with me, it being on the island with me would be hell on earth. Like that's just something which I know about myself. So it was really interesting then watching because I'm like, okay, I think I'm a great exuberant person, but there is this small chance that they're just gonna show that annoying side of me. And they did show it. And like, you know, if like no one's supposed to like everyone. But I think the very interesting thing as well as being portrayed is how they portray that person's side that you're on, right? Where it's like, it's like, am I actively annoying someone? or is someone annoyed by me? And those two perspectives are so important because it's like, 
for one of them, if you're looking at, like for example, if I'm annoying Ty, it makes it seem like I'm being actively trying to annoy you. But if Ty is annoyed by me, then it's, pers it's something that the personality is not meshing with. So sometimes it felt as if, and may maybe because they didn't show my side of the story or other situations that it felt that I was annoying someone when it just, that I, you're hungry, everyone annoys everyone, like that's just how it is. But for most of the time, it did feel that they just showed my personality and viewers were able to decide whether they liked that personality or not. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, Kevin, uh, heralded as uh, the best player to come out of Canada, I think. Um, <laughs> apologies, Marianne, but like, you really, yeah. you really like came across as like not only the, one of the best Big Brother players of all time, but certainly the best Canadian player of all time. Did you feel that at the time? Did you feel the weight of that edit at any point? Thank you, Maritza. That's very, very kind. I, did, I thought, I completely like thought everyone in there was running circles around each other. And by the end of the game, I, I didn't know. I had an idea that I was sort of in control of the game. But until afterwards, I didn't know that it was so positive. And I also recognized the, the privilege to be a winner and to get that very generous edit. I mean, I have someone in my cast, I remember them coming to me during the game and almost in tears because they left the diary room and whatever happened, they weren't giving what they were supposed to give. But when you get something generous like this, it's like, no, I'm actually just clumsy. Like that is not part of my strategy. Like that is actually who I am. It's, I feel incredibly lucky that I got that filter that everything kind of went through. Well, and Bryce, you know, thinking about where you exited early, too soon in your season, and so do you feel like the show needed to show an edit of you, kind of how you got voted out or why you got voted out? Did you feel like the show had to ex make an excuse for why you went early when really you might not have had a control over that? Um, I, I don't think the show needed to show an excuse why I went out early. I think that if anyone that watches Kageon, they can see why. Um, so I feel like it, but again, that was a different time in Survivor, right? You know, since the diversity initiative, since season 40, we've come a very long way. So I think that although I went out very early in my season, um, and I'm here in Toronto with these winners, so I just question who really is the real winner? That's <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> And just as a, as a quick follow-up, thinking about kind of characters, you're p put on the beauty tribe, understandably. And so do you Why? think that, well, <laughs> I gotta work with what I have. Um, and so do you feel like that kind of put you into a box because you're on this beauty tribe? Absolutely, right? I think that, because I, I can, I'll never forget the day, I'm in the Philippines and they announced Brain, Beauty, and Brown. And I said to myself, now what's wrong in my own? And like, <laughs> I look around and I'm like, OMG. Uh, but I, again, I really feel like it speaks a testament to like casting. They saw someone, they saw uh, a personality that would be great. However, given the circumstances on Kagyan, I wasn't able to fight it out. However, uh, almost a decade in, after my season, here I am, right? Almost bigger than when I was before, prior to that. So I feel like, again, if we're talking character versus like reality TV, it's like my character speaks for itself. And so I think that, again, I felt like at a point in my life in when I was on Survivor, I wasn't the person that I am today. And I think that going through that experience, seeing who that person was, having empathy for that person that I could see on the screen, like my heart breaks for him. And it's like, I grow and I have learned from that and I've morphed into this person that is a better person than that person could ever be. So it's really an uh, amazing metaphor, meta butterfly effect. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, meta some, meta butter. <laughs> meta butter. Meta fly. Uh, Wendell, if you had won instead of Tony Winners at Ward, do you feel like we would have seen a different edit of you? I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, excuse me, I, I think on Winners at War, kind of one side of me was shown somebody who, in competitions, talked a little trash. I played basketball and football all my life. That's, that's what we do. We talk trash when we're competing, you know. But I was trying to be, you know, silly with talking trash on Survivor, but they kind of made it look like, oh, Wendell's talking too much and he's messing up his tribe or something like that. Then I was out there with Michelle, who we casually dated well prior, and um, they made it look like a kind of like a misogynistic ex-boyfriend kind of thing. And in actuality, Michelle and I were good friends on the island, 
and working together on the island, and it is not good for your game to let everyone know that you have a good friend on the island. And I guess because we weren't so obvious that we were working together, they took the aspects that made it look like we don't like each other and made it look like Wendell's just this bad guy. And so I just, I think had I gotten a little farther in the season, I mean, I still got further than Bryce got in Cagayan, <laughs> but, but had I, you know, had I won that season, I think my edit would have been a lot more holistic. It would have shown like all aspects of me. I think, I think it's good to show multiple sides of a person, not just someone in a specific light. And uh, I think that would have happened if I would have won. That would have been a great thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you're talking about how it's not good to play with a tight group because you know, that can cause problems, or it's not good to play with strangers because that can cause different problems. Jam Jam, you played with a tight trio. It was you, Carson, and Carolyn who kind of ran as a Tika three. And it, we're curious to know, when you watch the show back, do you feel like your edit and role within the trio felt authentic? Or were you watching back going, ooh, that's not quite what happened as, as the trio? Um, Story-wise, I didn't feel that what happened was not reflected, like it wasn't shown. Like I, I let's start because I was thinking of what to answer didn't like with the other questions. So now you're like, what? This is another question. <laughs> um, I, what I wanted to say regarding like my, what I saw from myself, I was very fairly shown maybe because they need a good winner and everything. But I was pretty on point to what, from what I saw. What you saw was basically what was happening from my point of view. And I cannot complain about the good or the bad. Like you said, I had some bad stuff, which I, it's not fair to say that I had some bad stuff because they're not showing what the other person said. I'm talking specifically about my good friend, Carolyn. It's like, they did show me being a little bit tough on her, but they don't show you what she said right before. And I think that's, I'm not talking, I think part of this conversation should be like what they want to show about another person. I cannot say that about myself because what you saw is basically who I am. Um, regarding my point of my, my position in the tribe, it was it was it was good. Um, I, I'm thinking in Spanish, but it was fairly precise to what it happened because that's what it was. It was like Carson and me talking about strategy constantly, and Caroline being strategic to the viewers because her brain was working, but it was not maybe connecting as well with us. Not because she wasn't good, but because all of her good ideas were inside of her. You know what I'm saying? So when you see the, the, the confessionals, yeah, I was a little surprised because I was like, yeah, I can see she had been amazing and she's a great ally and everything and we got to the end, but Carson was doing his thing, I was doing my thing and they show what we both did. And some of the times, um, we were doing the same thing, but Carson maybe said it prettier, and that's why they show him saying it, or maybe I explain it more funnier, and that's why I, but I can't complain as the player in the new era with the most confessionals out of everybody in the new era, and the seventh winner with the most confessionals, I cannot complain about my perception of not being real because I got a lot of error, so without the 90 minute episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I, what I really love about your answer is that it kind of links with what Marianne was talking about, that difference between annoying someone and being annoyed by someone. And that, there's a nuance there, though, as you're kind of highlighting, there's an editor's choice that frames that conversation of, are you being annoying or is someone being annoyed by you? And that's a very different conversation. Um, in, the, in that respect, Marianne, like, what do you consider to be a reality show? Like, for example, let's say there's a really unlikable winner. Is a reality show one that like depicts that person for how they were, how they steamrolled themselves to the end, or is a reality show one where it's edited so that we have a likable show and a likable winner? What is reality TV? Oh my gosh. I think this is like a someone who has a class about reality question. <laughs> but it's so, that's the thing about reality TV is that the editors have, it's their power about how they want to go and share that story, right? 
do they want to go take the events and then have that narrative in the way that they want to explain the narrative, that is still under the umbrella of reality. Or it's like, do they want to go and say exactly how it is? But I think a thing, and that's also another fair way of reality, but I think a thing to keep in mind as well too is that we as players are here to play a game, but those who create reality are here to create a product. And sometimes what might you might want to see or you might not want to happen or might be shown differently because of those two conflicting views. So that doesn't mean that it's any more reality or any less reality. It just depends on what you value in reality TV. Because remember, Survivor is under the same umbrella as the Kardashians, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean that one's more reality. That doesn't mean that one's less reality. It's about the perspective and the way that it's viewed. Well, that actually nicely ties into our next question. And this is to, to everyone. You, all of you are setting us up really nicely to where we want to go next, is that you know, during the confessionals, are you aware of what you're, what you're being used for? Are you aware of the narrative that the producers are constructing for you? And if you do catch on to that, are you able to, in the diary room or in a confessional with a producer, are you able to change the conversation? Are you thinking, okay, this is what I think they're wanting from me, and I'm actually going to subvert their expectations, or I'm going to take it in a different direction to try to retake back that narrative? Kevin, what do you think? Yes. Yes. And how yeah. did, like, can you give an example of how you were able to try to redirect that narrative? So for me, I worked very closely with one other person. Her name was Helena. And very often, I would get questions that clearly made me out to be the narrator for the two of us. I, was, I, I think I had double the amount of DR as a surf. And a lot of the time, I would kind of be like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a 50-50. We're, we're even in this. And, and I would get because they can't give you information, so I'd get into a little bit of a battle there. My strategy was choosing also when to give information in the diary room because they don't know what's going on in your head when you're in a conversation with someone. One thing they can show, so there was an episode of Big Brother US, I think this week, and someone in there was saying, tell me when this happened. Felicia said, tell me when this happened. They showed the clip. You can argue with facts in any of these shows, but no one can argue with how you feel. So if I can say I was feeling this or this was my strategy, they can't push back on that. So you, you actually have information in there to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wendell, yeah. I think, I think it takes a really, um, like a really astute player to go into a first season and understand how to use the producer that's sitting there with their with them in their most intimate moments, asking these questions of whatever might have just happened, for them to understand, oh, this producer is trying to steer me in a certain way, or this producer is trying to get something out of me, and I should actively figure out a way to change that narrative. I think in my case, on my first season, I wasn't, I, I understood that the producer was trying to get things or maybe even leave nuggets for me. I remember um, when I, when Donathan came onto my tribe after a swap, and I'm like, this country boy, like, he is, he is so strange, but I want to be his friend. And I just didn't know how to talk to this guy. And I'm sitting in the confessional, and the producer was like, well, do you think you should just go talk to Donathan? And I'm like, maybe I should go talk to Donathan, you know? They, they have ways of steering you in, in directions and whatnot, but when it's your first time out there, I think you're just trying to get the info out and just answer all these questions. And you're not necessarily, you don't exactly know, like, man, I need to either look for nuggets from the producer or even try to reframe or redirect this, whatever this narrative might be that they're trying to, to pitch. Because it's like, generally speaking, usually it's, it's your first time on TV. So, um, Kevin, I think, I think you're very, like, you're in tune and you know your stuff. And that might be why Mert said you are, I'll say, one of the, one of the best to come out of Canada. <laughs> no, you got to lay it on the line. you got to lay <laughs> but, it on the line. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't think it's easy for a first-time player to do that. So did week that, one, did that, oops, go ahead, I, I was not like that week one. Week one, I was in there, like, probably seven or eight days in after week two, and I was like, oh, I didn't tell you anything in my head. I didn't explain anything that's going on. It took... I mean, I was in there for almost 70 days. It took probably at least a couple weeks to get to the point where I could start playing that game. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask similarly, because it took you some time, I guess, for Wendell to you on your follow-up return season. 
were you more attuned to the producers and the questions that they're asking you in terms of what character they're having for you in Winners at War? I want to say yes, but then again, like the, in the confessionals, I'm like, oh, me and Michelle were just kicking it three years ago. So <laughs> I, I think I was more in tune with wanting to um, have a little more fun in the confessionals, yeah. you know, like not just be like serious and just answering the questions. But I think they were able to take certain nuggets and just get me out of there with it. Um, I think we're going to start moving over into our third topic now. Uh, when the season wraps, obviously when you were there, you have a picture of what you actually did, the moves that you made, the stories that you shared with the other players. Um, but sometimes that doesn't really translate to the actual show itself. Uh, casting and gameplay allows for production to create a character. So now we want to talk a little bit about the impact of character on a player uh, and who you were after you saw the show. And so this is open to the panelists. Do you perceive a difference between the character you were edited versus the person you are, or the player you are? And did the character you saw in the show align with how you played the game? Or when you got home, I know Jam Jam, you kind of spoke a bit about how what you saw is what you got. But did anybody else see themselves in the show and go, ooh, that's not really me, or that's a, a highly edited version of me? Like, I'll jump in first. I feel as if the biggest thing for me as well, too, is just I remember watching each episode and looking at Omar and being like, okay, they'll show us about our lines this week. They'll show us about our lines this week. I think for at least, like, it took me until probably the final seven to give up on that, you know? And because, like, at that point, he was going to be gone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so interesting, that perspective, because I'm like, I because at least coming out of the game, I'm like, that part of me strategizing with Omer, that part of me still having that strategy was a very big part of my game, where it's like uh, some people perceive that the way that I played my game was just like, oh, she was happy-go-lucky, then at the end, she just managed to make it at the end, and it's her personality, but it's like, I, at least from the way that I believe that I played it from talking to my castmates, it's like I felt as if I had that strategy that wasn't shown. So then that came to the point where it's like, well, what am I going to do about it? So I spoke my truth in a super long deep dive with Rob's sister. You know, thank him, bless his soul for he let, letting me attack him and kidnap him for so long. But I think the thing about, like, when you have that dissonance between you on TV and you as a person, mm -hmm. it's like, unfortunately, the matter of fact is you're just going to have to come to peace with it. And I think, like, it's so important to know that you are the one who was there playing the game. You are the one who have first, like, first-hand access to a lot of the players, and you need to know your narrative and know yourself so that whatever is shown on TV, if it conflicts with how you think you are, you still know that that conflict doesn't matter because you know who you are. Ty, when you go back, like, sort of, is there anything you have a problem with? Like, I just liken it to, for example, if you didn't win that last challenge, yeah. you know, or sorry, if Claudia didn't take you, you know, would you, do you think that you would still be happy with sort of the way that you were presented or are you just sort of like making a smile with the dollar bills that you now have for winning? No, I, def <laughs> I definitely think that um, if I was evicted earlier and I didn't have that hero's arc at the end, if you want to call it that, that I would have had, a, not a hard time, but I would have been kind of bitter or jaded about it um, simply because that's not who I am. You know what I mean? There was a specific instance where me and Kuzi got into a little argument and the way it was edited, it made it look like I stood up and kind of like big dog her. And I seen comments on Instagram, people are saying Ty's a, a woman beater. I'm like, whoa, 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 where is this coming from? And then like five minutes later, Kuzi texted me and she goes, yo, the way they edited it made it look like you were like being abusive to me. And that was not how it happened. I was simply showing her how hope stood up to me. So that was like a, a clear instance where how the editing really twisted the situation and made me seem a way that I really wasn't. Um, so to answer your question, I feel like, yeah, if I didn't end up winning and having like a better ending, it probably would have left me a little bit hurt, but that wasn't the, the case, obviously, so I'm happy about that. And, you know, I'm just looking back, I'm, like I said, my goal going in there was to just be myself. I wasn't going to be anybody that I wasn't. And whether it won me the game or lost me the game, at least I could fall back on that, whether people like me or not, you know what I mean? So. And, and Jam Jam, how important is what Ty is saying, like, in terms of, like, how important is it or how much do you credit being yourself to your win? A hundred percent of it. I credit it to being myself. I mean, it sounds funny because I love myself, right? But um, it wasn't always like that. But 
I was so fucked. What do you ask again? Well, I'm just I'm just saying that like, do you credit like sort of putting yourself out there, being who you are, not trying to sort of suppress your personality in a game of social dynamics? Like, you could have easily gone there and played sort of under the radar, but yeah. you didn't. Which, when I watch it back, it's like that's a risky way to play. You know, like I want to vote out this loud guy. Like he's making yeah. it, and you didn't do that. And so I wonder, was mm -hmm. being at peace with yourself? How responsible yeah. was that to your win? Being at peace with myself was super important, but it, it you say like, yes, I was being 100% who I am, but I was also 100% being the nice jam jam. Because mm -hmm. um, as a business owner, as running a team of 28 people, having 60 plus customer daily that are very, very, very high strong by big personalities, powerful people, um, I have to daily dial back my personality to be um, agradable. Does anybody know what that means? Like to be, to be like someone, like people find me like, oh, he's so cute, mm. right? Because you don't want to be threatening, but I did it on purpose. Mm -hmm. Like I would hide that and socialize with people and understand, like I talk a lot with Lauren about this, like I can get mad too and I can like burn the, shelter down but I know that's not gonna help me you know and I took that down like I only had one time when I got really mad was because I didn't want to do rice because some people had reward and I was like what the f Danny like these people don't want to eat I don't give a like I'm gonna clean the pot and I'm gonna do rice but it, I was and then I went to watch the pot I was like chill out chill out he only saw you doing that nobody else saw you and I talk about that in my final travel council I was like I have to dial back my personality because I do get in confrontations a lot with people. And going back to um, stuff not being shown of who you are and you're not, I cannot, maybe what you said, like I said, like I, ha I feel okay with what they show about me, mm -hmm. but I don't feel okay of what they didn't show from Jamie or what they didn't show of mm -hmm. Lauren or Heidi. Because even though Jam Jam, I feel happy with what was shown. And I say Jam Jam because that's my nickname, you know, that's why I speak like that um, on Survivor. And, but they went out of the way to make some of the, the people on the show be really cool and nice, which they are. And they went out of their way to show like amazing fucking people like Jamie, which is the sweetest person in the world to be kooky, crazy, and undesirable again, among fans. And it, she was so important for my game. Like they, there's a reason I got seven votes at the end because I was working with everyone. I was working very close with Lauren and Jamie and they didn't show that because they were not showing her. Mm -hmm. They were just showing the three of us doing our thing. But there's, there's a lot of missed stuff from who she is as a person, why she got sixth place, why Lauren got fifth place. It was not a mistake. They were playing hard. And this is what like, I like to say when I talk about Jamie and Lauren, the reason Carson and I and Carolyn had to step up our game was because we were playing with against good people. Mm -hmm. But because we were maybe more fun in confessionals and because we were successful at it, that's why they only show our part. Yeah, go yeah, for please, yeah. You, you made a great point in terms of like the voting at the end. Like, you know, obviously we have all these viewers watching the show and like everyone has their opinions, but what it comes down to is what your, your housemates or you know the rest of the, the survivor people are voting at the end. And like me having the storyline that I did and being this undesirable player, but ending up with an eight to one vote, you need to kind of question, okay, well, why does everybody feel okay voting? Especially against who I was sitting beside, someone who won safety from Canada. So it's like, why did she get a single vote and I had eight? There has to be something deeper there. So I, I, I kind of challenge everybody to challenge everybody to kind of think deeper. If the votes don't come out the way you expect it to, there has to be something there that you guys are not seeing or isn't being shown to you guys. Yeah, that's exactly what this panel is kind of highlighting, yeah. that what, what we see isn't always w what the reality yeah. is behind the scenes. And it makes me kind of think about, you're all talking about the way you were edited, what you were, the way you were shown on TV. And Bryce, I want to come to you, um, because you talked about how, it was 10 years ago you played Kagayan. Not that, not that long ago. Yeah, not that long. Somewhere in that range. Roughly yes, 10. Roughly. roughly 10. And so the world kind of sees a picture of you 10-ish years ago on season 28. You've grown, as you've talked about. You have, you know, you, your positions have changed, your thinking has changed, but the world only kind of sees you in this time capsule. And so we're kind of curious, how do you navigate that difference between separating your on-screen character with who you are as an ever-growing, evolving person? So it's interesting that you say that, and I don't know whether or not this quite my response will answer this. However, uh, who I was back then, two, three, seven years ago, <laughs> um, 
I, I look at that player and sometimes I feel like Wendell always says like Survivor wasn't ready for a player like who I was. I was the first openly gay black player to play Survivor. 2016, 2014, around that time. And it is remarkable to think like when people say that like, oh, they weren't ready for you. I'm like, it's 2014, I was living my life. But you know, they weren't ready for that personality, that character. The editors had never really dealt with a, a black gay man. And so just even being in this panel, right, and listening to Jam, who is the first openly gay POC player to win and just making even that connection, for me, that's really what the connection is, right? Like, how do I evolve or how can that player evolve? You see the evolution of that player, right? A winner. Um, and so it's like, I even get a little emotional thinking about that because it's like, to even be this close and to hear his story and to know like that I felt at times that I had to dial myself, like my real self, I had to, I felt like I was dialing it down, right? And to hear Jam say, well listen, my personality was so, I had to actually dial it down because I wanted to, them to consider me as a, a formidable threat. So for me, that's the evolution of like how I feel about it, seeing players like Marianne and seeing players like Jam um, and winners like Kevin and Ty and, and Omer. Uh, <laughs> um, do you believe that in the sort of like new age era of these shows, people are cognizant that to succeed, they need to be a character? Uh, on Survivor Thailand, Brian Heide came on and said that he was on a business trip completely ice cold, just voting off people with no remorse. When we see these new Netflix shows, Love is Blind, The Circle, you can see people playing up to the camera. That's sort of the new wave of reality TV. You can't guarantee winning, but you can guarantee being memorable and perhaps more social media followers. Does this also take away from the notion that reality TV is real, or is the new age era that you have to promote yourself as a character the only way to succeed? I'm gonna start with Wendell. I, I think it depends on casting, first of all. I think Survivor does a very, very good job at casting. And I think they, especially now, they cast super fans more as opposed to recruiting pretty people and whatnot. Um, so, but then you, but then, I mean, Jam Jam, you're beautiful, okay? <laughs> Marianne, you're beautiful. Bryce, Bryce, you're all right, even though you're on the beauty truck. So, I think um, you do have people, like I had people on my season Ghost Island, there, there were a lot of recruits on my season and there were clear people that just wanted to boost their Instagram following and to whatever might come with that. In my case, as a builder, I, first of all, I love Survivor, I wanted to win the show, but I also wanted to get on national TV and just build a lot of stuff so maybe other networks can be like, oh, Wendell builds stuff. So that was what I wanted to use this platform for. Um, I think that, but to get back to the question, they, people know that they have to like, if you watch the challenge or something like that, you'll see certain people that want to fight with people or do things or like puff out their chest because they know that that's going to give them more airtime or more clicks or more whatever on social media. Or another season. Or another, guarantee them another season, yeah. And I think that, I don't know, I, I think that certain shows, they know they need to do that. I, I think that in other shows, Casting does a really good job at picking people that, yeah, they might do that, or they might just have over-the-top personalities in front of a camera. Um, I think it depends on the show, and I think the more people do that, I think it does kind of compromise the show. I don't think it makes the show much better. I think people that love the show make the show better. So. I don't know if I answered the question again. No, you, you did, but Bryce, I, I want your perspective on this too, because I know you watch like a lot just like I do. Like, do you notice a difference? Like when you see, I just noticed that when I'm watching these Netflix shows, you know, I've even heard people like say their Instagram account. Do you think that's going to hurt the genre overall? Like, you know, if we're talking in five years, I feel like you can't even go on this show without like, you know, mentioning your Instagram account. That is true. I think that there is a difference in reality shows and reality shows and so I think it's safe to say that like Survivor Big Brother are reality shows and shows like Too Hot to Handle and mm -hmm. other shows mm -hmm. they are a different breed a different type of form of entertainment. entertainment that is still wildly popular and people still love I think the integrity of Survivor kind of speaks for itself and it's uh 
evolution and, and moving forward in the cast that they play. Because I mean, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't tune into Good Too Hot to Handle or Housewives because that's what I enjoy. However, I don't expect to get the same level of gameplay that I am watching from Big Brother or Survivor. So I feel like it is up to the consumer kind of sorta to decide that. Just to piggyback, I like what Bryce said. You, you know what you get when you watch certain things. So if I'm watching Too Hot to Handle, I'm watching a bunch of like beautiful people hook up, right? And do weird things, right? If I'm watching Survivor, I'm watching people strategize and starve on the island and trying to think do while starving, things. doing weird things. <laughs> so it's like you know what you're getting with these shows and you know there are a lot of people that love to watch a Too Hot to Handle or those kinds of shows. And there are a lot of people, it just, it depends on what you want to watch at that particular moment. And I could watch both. Piggyback. Yeah. Like, it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? Like, if you want to get followers, you know what shows to get on, right? Because, like, like if you're tuned in, plugged into Instagram and you that's your goal, I'm not saying it's a good goal, I'm not saying it's a bad goal, but if that's your goal, you'll be like, what shows get the most followers? What shows get the most views? And you will then actively go on those shows. So then after it's like then, it, that's also a way that it can weed the people, for a lack of a better term, can weed themselves out, right? So it's like the shows which have more Instagram followers will always have those more people. I'm just I'm just thinking of the Love Is Blind. I don't know if anyone in here watches it, but when they had that Shake guy on, you know, and like he's trying to like meet up with this like girl behind the curtain, and he's trying to figure out what she looks like, but he can't see her, and so he says to her, "Well." Would you describe yourself as somebody I could lift on my shoulders uh, at a concert? And I was just like, you know, and he had to have known what kind of reaction that was going to get. And so I just feel like when you have a character like that that's playing up for the camera versus actually trying to find love, it's putting reality TV in a dangerous situation, you know? Any thoughts on what Mertz has put out there? Like, is, is there a danger? Ty, you look like you're, yeah. Yeah. Wendell already said it, so that you know what you're getting these shows. So when you watch mm -hmm. a too hot handle, you know that you're not going to get real gameplay. Like, it's reality, right. but it's not people who actually care about the game. You know what I mean? They're there for a good time. They're there to be this loud personality, to get the followers. That's, that's what matters to them. Mm -hmm. For me, when I was, you know, being cast for Big Brother, I'm trying to win this thing. I could be the most boring player, but if I win and my people see me there, that was my job, my goal. I came to play the game. I didn't care how many. If I didn't get one follower, I didn't care. I was trying to win the game. So I think you... Like Wendell said, it just depends on kind of you know, your priorities and what you're actually, what are you in it for? And I guess does the cash prize change kind of what brings you there? Because, you know, too hot to handle, yeah. or I guess does the cash prize too hot to handle, yeah. but love is blind, there's no cash prize, it's just, yeah. it's love, yeah. uh, which is, you know, so does that change kind of how players interact with the game? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it comes down to how, what does love mean to you? Is that like the end all be all for your life or are you just yeah. there for a good time? Some people just are there for the experience, right? They don't really care about the love, they're just there for the, there for the ride. So mm -hmm. it all comes down to the individual. I think it's subjective. Yeah. But I also think that, sorry to interrupt, there are reality shows or maybe docu-series that I like, like 600, My 600 Pound Life, right? You don't win money on that show, but you win your life. Uh, there are shows like Quarters that I am absolutely obsessed with and can spend Saturdays watching <laughs> all the series. And again, there are, but so there, I feel like there are different levels to certain reality shows. And some reality shows aren't really like a cast prize. Uh, there are shows that you actually get to, people are being so vulnerable and really it's kind of like changing their life. Yeah. So, I mean, doctor now, <laughs> on my 600 past life. If you know, you know. <laughs> And this kind of, the, the next question we have kind of links with Marianne, what you were talking about, about how you have to feel good about knowing yourself, that mm -hmm. you know what happened on the show, and no matter what gets edited, mm -hmm. you know what the truth is. And it makes us think about how, you know, fans of the show develop this parasocial relationship with you. They think they know you because they've seen you on TV. Mm -hmm. They've watched you in confessionals. They've seen your pregame or your postgame interviews, your deep dive on Rob is a Podcast. Mm -hmm. And they think they have, they think they know who you are and what happened on the island mm -hmm. or on, in the Big Brother house they don't. And I guess what I'm curious to know is, does it ever weigh on you psychologically where there are people out there that have a picture of who you are, but they actually don't know who you are or that authenticity is flawed in their own brains? I don't think it weighs on me. And like, I think a part of that as well too is come from going from being a big fan of the show to then being able to play the show. It's like, I recognize like, that I had parasocial relationships with past players. It's like, I thought that I knew the perspective of past players. So it's like, 
I understand that there are fans that have those parasocial relationships, but it's like, it's then I think in a kind of position, I can't, for lack of a term, it's like, to then it, for me to expect my past self to know what I know now and act accordingly would be very unfair because as players, we get to have a bigger, like a different view from behind that curtain, which so many people won't be able to see. So I think that's where it comes to peace with it because like, I know that I had thoughts about Wendell. I know I had thoughts about Price. Like, if you looked at my Reddit, I probably commented about one of y'all in your seasons. Like, that's just how it is. Nothing bad, I promise. I screened. But, All right. All like, right. it's just something that, like, I think it's not something that keeps me up at night, but it's just that interesting part about reality that, like, like one of you said, it's a snapshot of your life, right? And it's like, you go in, like at least me, I go. I went in knowing, knowing that that snapshot would be there, and it's like, and I'm, and for me, it's like I, I'm totally fine with people discussing me with that aspect of the snapshot because that's what I did, and that's exactly how I was before, and, you know, yeah. Um. So now we're gonna move into uh, one of our final sections. This is one that I'm, I'm by far the most excited about because we haven't really done it at a Real Talk before. Uh, but we wanna try something uh, at this panel. Uh, we like to call it an improv game and we're gonna put you uh, in a situation um, and we're gonna present that situation in three ways. We're gonna pair all of you, so I'll let Hartley explain the first pair. Sure thing, and I'm very excited. As someone who teaches a course on Survivor, the other work that I do at McMaster is improv, so this is, this is my wheelhouse. So we're gonna pair up Bryce and Wendell. You're gonna be our first pair to start. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Well, we figure the two of you should lead off as this is a Bryce and Wen presents. Let's do it. So we're gonna imagine, we're gonna, create a reality for you here. We're at a restaurant. Are we on a date? Uh, not quite. Okay. We have, it's a waiter-customer relationship. <laughs> I'm definitely so. the customer. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell, we're gonna have you be the waiter. <laughs> and we're gonna have Bryce be our customer. And the way we want this to be played out is we want you to improvise this scene where Bryce, we want you to play a bit of a villain a customer that is very entitled and very upset, um, very villainous. Okay. And Wendell, we want you to be the hero waiter who just simply made an error or made a mistake in a genuine attempt to serve correctly. And, and just one thing, it's very important that the other panelists that are in this pair pay attention to every word they say, because what they say is going to play a role in yours. Uh, so we can get started. Um, uh, hello, sir. I brought you your uh, cheesesteak. Here you go. Is that gluten free? <laughs> well, the bread isn't gluten free. I specifically, when I came to this establishment, uh, read a review online and put an order in that I wanted my bread gluten free and I didn't want flowers on my table. I have really bad allergies and I just, I'm confused as to why you are not Thai and why I have Wendell. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, sir, I apologize, but this is a, um, it's a gluten restaurant. The, the name of the restaurant is Gr Gluten Restaurant. And <laughs> I am sorry that the cheesesteak that you ordered has gluten, but I can prepare another cheesesteak that has no bread. Is there a manager I can speak with? You're looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I apologize for the flowers. I just thought that you would like them because, um, I think they're beautiful, and I, I think that you're beautiful. Well, what can you do for me? Because this, this gluten will have me gluten later, so. <laughs> Here's what I can do. I can give you, um, I can give you a discount, and I can remake the cheesesteak with no bread. So it'll be a gluten-free steak with cheese and no bread. I'd like it for free, but you could do that for me, thank you. 50% off? I like it for free. <laughs> All right, let's end it there. Let's end it there. Let's end it there. Uh, all right, so now it's going to be Jam Jam and Marianne. Uh, we're going to give you a choice uh, over who's the customer and who is the waiter, so that's up to you. Mm -hmm. The only difference now is that we want the waiter to be the villain, 
rude, belligerent, unapologetic, and we want the customer to be the sympathetic one. Ooh. The twist is you can only really use the same words or the same sort of items that Bryce and Wendell did. So it's the same scene, except we're gonna see it from a different perspective okay. with the sympathetic customer. Do you wanna be the customer or do you wanna be the waiter? You can be the customer. No, I'll let you choose, you're new. You've done this before? No, you're new. You you like you just in Canada? No, like you're straight out, <laughs> straight out of the survivor win. So you choose. I'll be the waiter. Okay. Hi, I'm so so sorry, but I ordered my Philly cheesesteak, and I can see that there's bread. I just want to confirm with you to make sure that the bread is gluten free. Well, if you read the sign on the door, you obviously knew it was a gluten restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I know it's a gluten restaurant. I saw a review that you still have accommodations for those who um, don't, are able to, aren't able to eat gluten. And I also saw that you were able to have accommodations for those um, who are allergic to flowers. I'm really allergic to pollen and I'm really sorry, but I saw there's flowers here. I really don't mean to be a hassle, but like, is there any way that we can move the flowers or You're anything? being an asshole. <laughs> And if you don't like the flowers, you can either sit on the floor or do whatever you want, but they're staying because they're pretty like you are. Oh. And if you don't appreciate prettiness, then don't be pretty. Okay. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm really sorry that like the flower, it's your space. I'm, I really apologize. Then yeah. is there any way though, then if I can get the cheesesteak, but just not the bread? I don't that... know what you read, but I could probably have an option, but unless you say it, I'm not gonna go out of my way to give you that option. Okay, that's very fair. I'm really, really sorry for taking up so much of your time as well, too. So thank you so much for listening to me. Um, you know so, what I can do? I can just take the yeah. meat and cheese out and just put it on the plate and you can either eat it or take it to go, whatever you want. That would actually yeah? be amazing. <laughs> amazing, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Jam Jam, I think you might have a, a restaurant tour business ahead. <laughs> I am very well known in my business to deal with the very difficult clients. <laughs> I do shake because I don't like fighting, but I I can be an asshole. <laughs> well, for our final two, Ty and Kevin, we are going to ask you this time to play the same scene again. You're still at the restaurant, and you're still kind of using the same idea that you saw in the past two rounds. But this time we're gonna ask you to perform without any heightened villainy or heroism. We're gonna have one of you the waiter, one of you the customer, but this time there's no characterization. There's just a difference of opinion around the gluten restaurant. So you can do decide who wants to be the waiter, who wants to be the, the customer, and then play it out without any heightened characterization. <laughs> okay, so here's your uh, Philly cheesesteak. Thank you. Oh, actually, does this have gluten in it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the name of the restaurant is Gluten Restaurant, so. <laughs> no, like, not to be rude or anything. Oh, I'm actually gluten free. Okay, um, what's the best kind of, like, option? Like, you want me to just take the bread off? Do you want me to see if you have any gluten free stuff in the back? I don't yeah, think I'll, I mean, I'll double check for you. I read a review online that said that you have accommodations for gluten free folks. Okay, uh, I'm the manager. I don't know who put that review up, but we definitely don't have. I heard it down the hall. <laughs> I'm not sure where that voice down the hall came from, but it wasn't mine, so. Okay. Um, yeah, if there's anything we can do, I just can't eat this. Just give me a sec. Yeah, sorry, there is no other option. What about the flowers? Well, I'm also allergic to flowers. Uh, I heard down the hall you have flowers, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have flowers. I mean, this is a goofy restaurant. Yeah. They're beautiful flowers. Um, they're kind of a staple here, so I'm not sure. This, this might not be the restaurant for you, to be honest with you, if I'm oh. just being. I, I want to support your business. Yeah. Would, would it be okay just to give me maybe something that I can eat and move me away uh, from the flowers, please? I can probably like take the bread off and then you have the steak and cheese and then yeah. the flowers. I mean, I can probably move them over here, but would that help? Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. All right, perfect. We're gonna end it right there. And so I think, I think our point in that was to show you how one scene can sort of be twisted. Like you saw what Ty and Kevin just did, that was the actual scene, but depending on how it's edited, you can make one person the hero, one person the villain. And I think that is a good place for us to end this portion of the panel. Um, 
We're now going to take some questions um, from the audience that you submitted. We're going to do it a little bit differently than we did it last time. Um, Harley, I'll let you take the first one. Sure thing. We've got, uh, as audience members were coming in, people submitted some questions to a box, and we've grabbed a bunch here, ones that have already been answered and some new ones here. Uh, and we'll start with this question here. If someone receives an audience backlash due to their character, and this is to tie into the last Real Talk event that you did on mental health, what mental health supports are available to players during the airing and after the season? Do, does the show offer any supports um, for you? Yeah, um, so before you go on the island, I, maybe I shouldn't answer this. Yeah. It's too I recent, can, it's too recent. I, yeah, I it's speak. too recent, yeah. Well, well, they I'm messed offer, up, I'm kidding, no, I'm kidding. They'll <laughs> offer support. Yeah. They have therapists um, to, at least in my time, they had two therapists that you could speak to and then they would also refer you as well if you needed referral to another person like like i know personally i was referred because they were scared about my social media use because i said i was going to be all over reddit and they will refer you to people as you need at no additional cost and you can also go and get as many or as little sessions as you need i know that and i know that there were people who struggled with their portrayal on the show and they did go and talk about that to the therapist as the season was airing what about for Big Brother? Similar? They give post-show support, and if you really need it, you can get it during filming. I mean, it is it, it is a social experiment, Big Brother and Survivor, so I think these shows have gone better, but there's still work to do. I honestly feel like, yes, all of that is available. I would suggest to get somebody that it's not related to the show, mm -hmm. because it's like going to like matrimony therapy with your husband mm -hmm. as your therapist. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's just my opinion. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. I will say uh, Survivor started something new with um, more recently where they're, they're starting to send out some things ahead of time to the cast, essentially saying like, these are some things to look forward to or these are some ways to get through it. You might have a weird edit or you might have fan backlash here are some ways that other players got through it so they're trying to get ahead of the ball I think that's a good thing. I'm piggybacking on, every, on that because I just like the word piggybacking um, I appreciate a lot of what the people before 44 did and that thing that he might be referring to came up with us I mean we didn't get that reward but it was Every season has a conversation, and Survivor, for, for first hand, I've seen like they make an effort to get better every time. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it's still like season 45, 46, and they're still growing, and I told you, like, I really appreciate it. There's always room for growth, like anybody, any, anywhere, but Survivor is always, and I think Jeff has a lot to do with that, because Jeff actually, in his own way, cares a lot about us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question is, since leaving the show, has public reception had any impact on your relationships or lifestyle now that you're not in the game anymore? Uh, let's start with you guys, Kevin, first. One of the best things I got from the show was learning how much my family and, and friends were there for me, and you're in this like heightened experience, so in terms of changing my relationships, when I came back, it was not easy to be the boyfriend and son and friend I wanted to be and it's something I put a lot of work into and, and I think I've gotten better at it since then because to me that's what's when you're taking when that all gets taken away to me that's what's important. Ty has public reception changed for you since coming back? Uh, yeah my personal relationships have gotten stronger just because my family and friends obviously seen the lash I was getting while I was in the house and dealt with it while I wasn't here but uh, I think in terms of people who didn't know me, once they got a chance to have a conversation with me or like just be in my presence and see that I'm not the person that they were seeing on the TV, I, I think people have come around to at least being accepting of me, if not liking me. So yeah, definitely. Uh, let's go to Jam Jam next. What was the question? Um, ha has public reception had any impact on your relationships or lifestyle since you left the show? Like, has anything changed in your life based on how people saw you I on Survivor? I think I'm too recent to not feel a certain way about that. Um, yeah. 
yeah, it's it's not all good, it's not all bad, but you know, you learn how to deal with the changes, especially because I, this is something I was telling to Wendell and Bryce earlier uh, yesterday. I think it was like the fact that we know who wins right away. I feel like it's a big burden on everyone. Not only the people that lose, not lose second, third place is still amazing, um, but to have to keep such a big secret for 11 months, you have to do it for 10 months. Um, your family, I mean, my husband knew right away when I came back home, but my mom didn't, my best friends didn't, my brothers, nobody. Um, they don't know why you're reacting a certain way because they haven't seen the show, right? Um, they don't know if it's because you won, because you lost, because you're crazy, because you're optimistic, because you feel like you're Superman, because you're like, you know, punishing yourself, but because you have that secret and because they don't have um, a a base as to why you're reacting with the way you're reacting, they're making hypotheses. Oh, it has to be because he won. Oh, it has to be because he lost. Oh, and that damaged a little bit throughout the process. Just when the show ends, then you're finally able to like, oh, now you know why, now you this, now that. But it's still for me to reason to, mm. to be able to amend some of the stuff. Is it tough, just your answer made me think about, is it tough to not want to share while you're watching your season air? Because you know what's coming. You know what happens in your narrative, though you can't share that publicly. I didn't because, first of all, we have a contract. Of course. Which is like humongous. <laughs> I'm very frightening. But anybody would sign that contract if they tell you you're gonna be on Survivor, so don't question that. <laughs> but, I never wanted the result of my game, result meaning I won, to um, change the way people were gonna support me throughout the airing and throughout the episodes. I didn't want it to have people be fake or change because I won. So that's why I didn't say it. Like, I was like, if you're gonna support me, support me without knowing what happens. And I think that's the answer to the question, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't say it. Yeah. And I guess kind of this is tied into a lot of the conversation that we've had tonight. You know, people have shared what was shown on TV and how that impacted you. Was there anything that wasn't shared that you wanted to kind of share with us tonight? Of things that happened in the Big Brother house or on the island that wasn't captured, that really highlighted the player that you were and not the character that they edited you to be? Um, on season 40, um, on season 40, I was on a tribe with Officer Sarah Lacina, and I was I had uh, I was in an alliance with her and with Tony and some others, Nick Wilson, and um, being a, a black man in America, and on a tribe with an officer who I thought was who became a friend of mine, right? I once we established a bond, I was like, let's open up about relations like black relations with officers in America and we had a conversation she told me her standpoint she's from where is she from Iowa. Iowa she's from a smaller police department the things that happen in her police department might not happen in the Philadelphia police departments so I was able to understand a different perspective and from my perspective what I see in my bubble in my algorithm is a lot of brutality and things like that um, in Philadelphia, I see police that turn on their sirens just to run a light and just keep going. I see, you know, I see things that she might not see. She's like, we get in trouble as officers if we use profanity on the job. I'm like, I hear a cop using all kinds of profanity in Philadelphia. So I was able to see a different perspective, and I think she was able to see that perspective, my perspective. And this aired during 2020, think Black Lives Matter, George Floyd mu movement, and all that stuff in America. And I'm just like, I hope that this gets time on TV. And then I watch my edit and it's like, Wendell's being a, a jerk on TV every week after week after week. And we don't get this valuable discussion. And I'm just like, man, I wish that would have aired because I'm one of two black people on this island right now. And people in certain parts of America might not even have black friends. And if they would, if they would show this conversation, that might show a different side of someone that they've never experienced, and that might change their perspective. That might 
an officer might see that, and that might change an officer's perspective. So I was just a little, I was, and I told Jeff this once we had a, a, a deeper conversation on diversity much later, but um, I wish that conversation was shown on that, on that season. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, unless there's anyone else, are we good? Okay. Uh, this question, uh, one of our last ones, was asked by Robert Wallace. So, Robert, wherever you are in here, thank you. Was your survivor experience or your reality show experience everything you expected prior to going into the game when you really didn't know what to expect? Did it fulfill your expectations? Um, we will start with Marianne. Oh, my gosh. I thought I was going to win an immunity challenge. <laughs> that didn't happen. But I think that... I went into the game with like a survivor bucket list of all the things I wanted to do, all of like every single thing that I wanted to do. And like, I remember there were so many different little things like where some of them just didn't happen. Like I was like, survive a tribe swap, you know, win immunity, like well, tribe swap was never gonna happen. But there were other things that I really wanted to do. Like I was just like, make a new friend, like be like, have a genuine conversation. And it's like aqua dump, right? And I think they were just like different, like, of course it wasn't everything that I expected it to be, but for what I wanted to get out of it, because I did come with like open expectation about being like, wow, well, you know, I can read everything that I can, can find about it, but it's gonna be different being there. I feel as if it's like, I still got what I wanted out of it, and I still had such an amazing time. Bryce next. Um, all I wanted to do was make the merge. Right, like that was like my big dream out there was just make the merge and have the merge feast. Um, and I can remember uh, getting voted out, going to Ponderosa, and like that night in Ponderosa after having a couple of margaritas, I remember just feeling like my survivor experience is over and like it's so short lived. Uh, again, but being a super fan and loving the show, and instead of like using that and being like, oh, my survivor experience is over, I chose to be positive and I chose to breathe light into the new seasons and show love. And I think that, you know, my survivor career is still going because I get to have meaningful relationships and sit on panels like this. So I think it's more than I could have ever dreamed. I still want to taste the Merge Feast though, but I mean, That's fingers. I didn't, I didn't taste That's it. That's a bad news No, don't, don't spoil it. <laughs> uh, and just the Big Brother guys, was it everything you wanted it to be? You both won, so I'm assuming it was. I went in knowing that if everybody comes in for, with the same chance, which they don't in reality, let's say it's one sixteen, I was like, what else do I want to get from this experience? And whether it was one day or the whole way, I was like, I'm just going to try and have fun with it. And so my expectations were very much like, I just want to control what I can control. So, I mean, I, I couldn't be happier than to be sitting here with all these cool people and have this come out of it. Like, I'm so... I'm so thankful. The expectations were, were, it was like, oh, everybody's gonna hate me. I'm gonna be first one out, and uh, everything's gonna go terribly. My family and friends are gonna dislike me when I come out. I'm gonna be single. Like, <laughs> I'm, I, I couldn't be more thankful. Ty? Yeah, I'm super grateful. I, I didn't know what to expect. Honestly, I just came in here to compete, and I was like, however it goes, I just want to be a respectable person, and like, whether people like me or not was beyond it. Like, coming from around. Co Coming from where I come from, like being on TV in general is like a dream come true. So the fact that I was on it, that was enough for me, and which is why I was like, however this turns out, it's cool. Um, but I didn't think I'd be hated. Unfortunately, that backfired quickly, but it's fine. And I'm just grateful, like I said, to be on a panel and have these opportunities past the show that are, I wasn't even thinking past the show. So the fact that I have the opportunity to sit here and talk to everybody and people see another side of me in here, my perspective is just like a blessing. So. And before I turn it over to Hartley for our last question, um, one more question I have is, um, Kevin and Ty, if you were in the same Big Brother house, uh, which, who would be the winner? Uh -oh. <laughs> Marion. Listen, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I don't know. I told him I would want to work with him. Like, this guy is a genius, so, but it would just come down to comps at the end, right? So, we're... Then, then I think we know. <laughs> uh, if it comes down to comps, <laughs> that's not a... No, then it's I, over. If, if you both sit in the final two, he, he's definitely probably taking the cake because like, his game is crazy. So, I have to share that um, thinking about like as a huge, 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 humongous fan that I am, I collect stuff from even Africa, Marquesas, Thailand. Like I am a huge fan, um, like real stuff. Going on Survivor, I mean, I didn't. I was optimistic about me wanting to win and everything. Like I always said, like as the universe stuff, and it would give it back to you. So yes, that part. But being there on the island. 
even traveling on the plane, seeing the people walking, seeing Jeff lands on a helicopter, say hello before the game starts. You're on the boat, getting on the beach, moving every time on the beach to challenges, like leaving your original tribe camp to go to the merge camp, going into challenges in a boat. Everything felt so surreal, magical, like painted like a painting. It was so beautiful. Like I even told the producers, I was like, even when, when um, Caroline Carson and I did the, the Three Stooges at Tika by the Big Tree, um, I was explaining it. I was like, even when Caroline and I, Carson and I were talking, whenever I wasn't talking, I was actually seeing myself from the top like I was dead. And I was like, I'm on fucking, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm inside the TV. <laughs> this is it. And the producer was like, so you're like watching yourself from like from a part. I was like, if you need help with that, we can get you help. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, well, you need to understand. This is how my brain works. Like I would dissociate, like, but in a good way, and see and appreciate every single moment. And I would cry on the boat going into challenges. And I was like, I hope these people. By the half of it, I didn't care. They see me cry. But at the beginning, I would be like, I don't, I don't want these people to think I'm crazy because you know I'm crazy, but not like bad crazy. But it's beautiful, so it's, it's, I was so thankful every single minute, every single, and everybody out there, the producers, everybody is amazing. I mean, you have fights with people once in a while, and I wasn't expecting to have, like, friction with some of the people in charge, but <laughs> I, you know, you have to say what you have to say. But I loved it, so I, everything I expected it was and more. It was contagious, though. We could feel when you're like, I'm so excited to poo in the ocean. Yeah. I, I, like yeah. they, they yeah. start the episode with yeah. that because I mean that's the other end yeah. of people who are just doing it to get followers. Jam Jam's out there having the time of his life. Yeah. If and you see that clip amazing. really closely, I didn't remember I said that until I show it. But that was the last thing I said on my day. That's called the Day Zero interview. Day Zero is what they film before the marooning because on day one they don't have enough time to do confessionals for 18 people, so they do that before the game starts. So that's why we don't have no box. Um, that day zero interview, I remember, um, I think it was, it was Joe. Joe asked me, like, anything else you want to say? And I'm, like, looking at the next island over, and I, I start getting teary-eyed. And if you see closely in that clip, my eyes are, like, glassy, like, from tears. And I was like, I'm just so excited. I'm so excited. I can't wait to meet Jeff. I can't wait to not shower, not brush my teeth, poop in the ocean, <laughs> bring it. And that's what made it, like, that was the title of the episode, by the way. But, yeah, I mean, I was, I, I'm, I'm still, the other day I was going to, the first time I met them, and I can talk forever, like, it's too, um, and I know we have to go, but the first, I, I'm thankful for everything. This, the first time I was going to meet them, Seri was supposed to be in the, in the party, and I was crying on the plane. I already won, I already played, I already came back, and I'm on a plane from Puerto Rico to Philly because I'm going to meet Seri crying. I never met her. She never got to the thing. I haven't met her yet. But I met her when she wins Big Brother, though. <laughs> um, I, think, I think that's a good place for us to end it. Uh, so I think we're going to offer our closing thoughts now. Um, the goal of reality TV is to create entertaining content for audiences to consume. Despite being referred to as characters, the players on reality TV are not in a role. They are real people. We hope that today illuminated how and what we watch and that players are more than just the characters they're presented as. And when Mertz and I were planning for today, we were thinking about and reflecting back on Survivor season eight, the all-star season, where in the reunion show, Jerry Manthe is booed off the stage at the reunion show, pleading with the crowd, we are real people. This is, we are not characters, we are real people. And we were just deeply kind of reflecting on that. And this panel tonight kind of illuminates how the characters are not characters, but they are people. And as audiences, we can easily forget that they're characters and we think that we're seeing real people in reality because it's reality TV. And just like in real life, when we see someone in the grocery store or on the bus, we are only seeing a snapshot into, the, into their lives, into the lives of others, which makes it very easy to either support them or villainize them depending on how we choose to see them. Uh, 
And, and before we give it up for all of our amazing panelists, we just have some people to thank. Um, we want to start with McMaster University uh, for giving us this space, which I think is one of the coolest spaces. Thanks to Hartley and his team for that. Um, I can't believe we got this for free. Uh, so if you need an event, call Hartley. I didn't. <laughs> um, we want to thank uh, Veronica, our operations coordinator, who also set up the green room for us, and uh, all of her family. I think she has a lot of family that also helped us here. Uh, Godfrey for bringing the ice, props. Uh, and Harant, who is our AV specialist, he's sitting over beside us, running all the music and the slides and chorus for filming it all. And Kevin for doing a lot of the yes, heavy Kevin. lifting and labor. Uh, can we get a hand for all of our team? Woo! And that's it. Let's give it up for our panel. Oh, Wendell. I got, I got one thing. First of all, can we give it up for Hartley and Mark? Yeah. Yes, um, let's give it up for the panelists. They did an incredible job. I only have two more things to add. Um, Omer is here. He was, he, he was going to sit on a panel with us, but he's studying for his board exam. So he's, you know, going, but he's here. And um, lastly, I wanted to say, we are having our event tomorrow night, the big watch party. Um, tonight we're doing a karaoke, kind of like a welcome chill event at the pilot. And we wanted to, it is a ticketed event, but we wanted to invite everyone in here for free. So if you don't have a ticket tonight to the pilot, you're more than welcome. It's at, um, it's at 8 p.m. Just say you were at the Real Talk panel. So you're all welcome. And uh, thank you guys again for coming. Thank you. And thank you, Franklin, for making this happen. We got a lot more real talk, don't we, Wendell? There's a lot more real talks planned, so uh, just uh, stay tuned to. You want to prop your Instagram? I mean, you guys can follow Bryson One Present, you know. But uh, yeah, we're we're trying to plan more of these these talks. They're they're awesome. So thank you guys again. Thanks, everyone. Thank